get started huh shall we instead of sitting here looking at each other it gets kind of awkward once in a while let's good to see all of you tonight why don't you stand grab your red hymn book and uh, we'll try to we'll try to get you breathing heavy right off the bat 827 if you would 827 Through my disappointment, strife and discontentment, I cast my every care on the Lord. No matter what obsession, pain or deep depression, I'm standing on the solid rock. I'm standing on the rock of ages, safe from all the storm that rages, bridge. But not from Satan's wages, I'm standing on the solid rock. Even though he's gone now, I don't feel alone now. With comfort came the Spirit of the Lord. Now with his word to guide me, from temptations hide me. I'm standing on the solid rock. I'm standing on the rock of ages, safe from all the storm that rages, rich, but not from Satan's wages. I'm standing on the solid rock. Now I'm pressing onward, each step leads me homeward. I'm trusting in my Savior day by day. And close is our relation, firm is its foundation, so on this solid rock I'll stay. I'm standing on the rock of ages, safe from all the storm that rages, rich, but not from Satan's wages, I'm standing on the solid rock. All right, 423, other song about the rock, the solid rock. This one's a little bit slower. 423, the solid rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. 
I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ a solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ a solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ a solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Amen. You can be seated. I'm thankful for that sure rock. All right, ushers, if you would come forward, we'll take up tonight's offering. Tonight's offering goes toward the general fund offering. Uh, don't forget, no service this Wednesday in celebration of the new year. And um, school starts the 6th. Don't forget that. I'm sure some of you can't. Um, anything else exciting going on? There's, there's an uh, upcoming uh, Soaring Eagles outing, but I don't have the dates on me, and I forgot them. But... Oh, okay. A soup supper. That sounds good. Sounds real good. All right. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege to be here. I just pray that you'd accept these gifts. Lord, bless each person that made it out tonight in this rain. Lord, I pray that you'd be with those who couldn't make it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, hey, let's open our Bibles. Uh, Brother Jack says open it anywhere, it's all good. Uh, <laughs> let's go back to, to, I'd like to go back to Genesis chapter 28. If you turn back there with me, please, Genesis chapter 28. Thank you to our musicians for all the fun. Uh, Genesis 20, I'm looking forward to um, Macville, Bluegrass Gospel Group is going to come uh, the 26th of this month It'll be Sunday night, and um, it, we'll just have concert. They're local people, and four of them used to be Amish, and uh, they're all, all, all a bunch of instruments. It'll be a lot of fun. So tell your friends about that. Make sure uh, we come out. All right, Genesis chapter um, 28, and I want to. I want to read this story here, beginning with verse 10. It says, Jacob went from Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed a dream, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and the God of Isaac, the land wherein thou liest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed. 
And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And you see, I'm going to bring thee again. Bring thee again. That's a phrase to remember. In verse 16, And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillow and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of the place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give a tenth unto thee. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you so much for what you've given us. And thank you for the many, many opportunities you ha- you've given us to, to fix ourselves and to correct our paths. And Lord, I pray that tonight uh, you would be with us in a special way that your will and, and your word would have free course in this auditorium. And God, I pray that every, every heart will be touched and stirred and challenged and encouraged. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, next time I see you, it'll be the new year. I won't see you till next year. Everyone's thinking about new year stuff, new year resolutions. And a lot of times you'll come to church and, and you know, as preachers, we just because we get on a theme, we'll bash a new year's resolution because we know and you know that probably within the first month uh you're going to lose it right like for example if you decide oh i'm going to get a planet fitness subscription or a y uh membership and uh, a lot of people the 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 y and planet fitness they understand this the ymca will give you at this time of the year a break. They'll give you a really, really low. They'll cut the bottom out from the cost, but you've got to be locked in for a year because they know that within two months, you're going to quit going to the Y. That's pretty much the way everybody, I mean, not everybody. Some people are very disciplined and will go long times exercising and so on, and they'll have these plans and they have goals in mind. But the average person doesn't do that. Uh, when we, we start we start out reading our Bible, I don't know how many of you have started out decided to read your Bible through the year, and maybe you've made it to March. God bless you. And uh, I don't know, some of you are smiling because some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. How many times you started out to read the Bible through, and I wonder how many times you actually made it to the end of the year. And so this time of the year, when we think about these New Year's resolutions, we think, wow, we're going to have this New Year's resolution and it's not going to last anyway, so why even make it? You know, I have a resolution. I'm going to eat more bacon in 2020. I believe that's a good resolution. I think it's something I can keep. Uh, I think uh, I think I'm going to drink uh, more coffee in 2020. It's a good resolution to do. It's a it's a it's a goal that I've set for myself. Now that's a that's a realistic goal, right? It should set realistic goals. You see what I'm saying? But th- all of these all of these things happen. We think about the problems we have of. Of 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 keeping our commitments and our vows, and but I want to tell you something honestly. God made us, and He knows the weakness of our flesh, and He knows how many times we stumble and fall. He knew that when He made us. He knew the weakness of our flesh. In Psalm seventy-eight, He said He often forgave them. Because he knew the weakness of the flesh. He knew that they were but dust. And as I thought about this topic, it occurred to me that throughout the Bible, there are many examples of people who fell and got back up again and fell again and got back up again and fell again and got back up again. And I found that the Bible is full of people who broke resolutions and made new ones. And I found that God can work with that. 
Don't avoid making a good decision because you know you're going to quit. Because I'll tell you what, if you keep getting back up again, you'll win. Hello? I want you to think about that. The story we read here of Jacob. Jacob is at Bethel and he's meeting with God for the first time. He's, his father knew God and his father walked with God, was called a friend of God. But this was the first time Jacob had made, had a relationship, his own personal relationship with God. And he's leaving his father's house and he's going to, to see his family, Laban and all of those. And he's fixing to go through a whole hard time. He's going to end up marrying somebody he thinks is somebody else. He's going to marry uh, this girl he thinks he's going to marry her and he's going to wake up in the morning and find out it's not the girl he thought he married. Wow, that's, that's a challenge. And uh, so then, then um, he, he decides to work another seven years and marries the other girl. Then they leave and so on. His whole, his whole life gets kind of messed up. He kind of loses track of Bethel. He's gone from Bethel. He's not near Bethel. He's not anywhere around. Kind of gets out of his mind. The vows that he made to God. Some of those things had slipped his mind. We get over to Genesis chapter 35. And I found this interesting. It says in verse 1, And God said unto Jacob, Arise and go up to Bethel. I want you to go back there where I met with you. And dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. And Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean and change your garments. Look, look at what happened. Over the period of years, he'd gotten married and they had brought those ladies had brought in their family traditions, their idols and their gods that had been passed down family to family to family. They brought them into this home, and Jacob didn't say anything. He loved his wives. He he wanted uh, to give them what they wanted, and and uh, yet over time he got desensitized and kind of forgot that he had a god he was supposed to serve, and he wasn't supposed to have any idols. He wasn't that supposed to have, and he kind of lost track of that. And that but, but here, God comes to him and said, it's time for you to go back to Bethel. You need to get back where I talk. You've gotten off track. You've gotten away from me. You've gotten a long ways away from me. So Jacob uh, talks to his family and he says in verse 3, let us arise and go up to Bethel and I will make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. And they journeyed and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. So Jacob heads back to Bethlehem. I find this several times in his life when he kind of got out of tra- off, off track with God, he would circle back and go back to Bethlehem. I remember... Years ago, Dr. Leon Maurer, an evangelist that I traveled with for some time, had a message he would preach called, Back to Bethel. It's time to get back to Bethel. And he had this phrase, I have no idea where he got it or what it even means, but he said, go back to where? The hall gate, the cabbage. I have no idea. It it, it must have meant something to him. But I'll never forget it. Go back to where? The hall gate, the cabbage. What he means is go back to where it started, where you got off track, what messed up, you get that? It's kind of a phrase that sticks with you. And you know what it means, even if we don't really know what it means. But, uh, <laughs> but back to Bethel, we get that. Going back there. Go back there. Some thoughts about this I want to give you tonight. You see, when you get off track sometimes, you get to thinking that you don't deserve to be back with God. You remember maybe the vows you made, and you remember the determinations, and you begin to feel like I'm not good enough. Maybe God won't use me. I messed up royally so many times and I knew better. Or maybe I didn't know better, but somehow or other I allowed things in my life and boy, I've been here before. I've been to Bethel before. I've been in an altar. I've prayed and I've asked God to, to, to clean my heart and I've got up and I've walked out and my heart's been clean. And then I've gone right back out in the world and I've gotten my myself all dirtied up with what the world has to offer. I brought those things into my heart again and wow, it just my life and my heart is all, all full and cluttered again. And wow, do I really even, if I go back to Bethel again, if I go back to where God uh, met with me again, will He meet with me again? Will He be there even? 
And I want to remind you of something that this story in Genesis 35, God Himself is the one that come to Jacob and said, it's time to go back to Bethel. And many times He's had His preachers come and get, it, get their bony fingers in your face. And many times He's gotten His preachers to come to you and say, uh, hello, it's time to get back to Bethel. It's time to get back to where God can do something in your heart. So, well, I've got all these broken pieces. Well, there's an old song. Pick up the broken pieces and bring them to the Lord. Pick up the broken pieces. Trust in His holy Word. He will put them back together and He'll make your life complete. Just bring those broken pieces to the Savior's feet. That's what you're supposed to do. Just bring it all back. He could do something with it. So how do you know for sure? Let me show you a verse over in Proverbs. Look at this. In Proverbs chapter 24. Hold there with me if you would real quick. Proverbs 24. Solomon was writing this. And he made a comment in verse 16. For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. A just man. I went through, the, through Proverbs and looked at the word just, and you know, the Bible says a just balance is the Lord's delight. And I got to thinking about a just man, what a just man is. A just man is someone who believes in fairness. A just man is someone who, who is a balanced person. He's, he's got it figured out, both sides. He's fair to both sides. He can see both sides. He's a just man. He's clear. He's smart. He's intelligent. He, he understands his, his society. He understands culture around him. He understands that there's cause and effect, that, that there's good and there's evil, and he understands how to make it all work the way it's supposed to. But that just man, that well-balanced man, falls seven times and rises up again. You see, the key to his life is not that he fell. The key to his life is he kept getting back up again. <laughs> when I was younger, I, I fancied myself to be a ping pong player. And uh, we uh, didn't have a gymnasium at our school or anything. The only thing we had was a foosball table and a ping pong table. And so we would spend hours and hours in, um, playing ping pong. And uh, when I, I became a teacher in a Christian school, and a, another teacher there... Um, his name was Jim. He and I, after school, our offices were right next to each other. And after school every night, he and I'd go play ping pong and foosball. I'd beat him in ping pong, and he'd beat me in foosball. And uh, that's that's what we did every day, hours and hours and hours. Well, I like to play ping pong a lot. I like to try different paddles, and and if you know about a ping pong ball, how you can spin the thing, and it'll do funny things, and. You like to watch the ball fall off the table and pop it back up over the table when no one realizes what's going on. Let it hit the corners. You guys know what I'm talking about. Some of you like ping pong like that. Oh man, it's so much fun. And it's so much fun to, to set somebody up, spin that ball, set somebody up. Some guy rises up with a ping pong paddle and he's going to slam it back at you. And he hits it and it goes off into the moon somewhere. And Man, that is just a blast. And he's embarrassed and or you spin it just right and it misses his paddle and he swings and swings all the way around. How much fun that is. There was one person that used to play and um, this person I wasn't real um, friendly with, um, just to put it mildly. And uh, she was somewhat um, challenging to be friends with and... and somewhat happy with the fact that she could beat everybody and took great pleasure in particularly beating all the guys in ping pong. So I decided I was going to take her on. I was going to play her and we were going to have fun. You know, everything I did, every spin I put on that thing, you, I'd slam it, I would spin it, I would curve it, I'd do everything and just keep coming back at me. She, she'd have this straight paddle, didn't have anything on it, all she did was just stood there. When a ball would come, she'd meet the ball and pop it back at you. It'd get frustrating. I'm like, everybody else would swing and miss, and she just, just consistent. 
Just wherever that ball was, she'd mean it, hit it back. Huh, drive you crazy. Finally, you'd do some stupid thing and she'd end up winning. That's the way she did it. Nothing fancy. Just pop the ball back at you. Kind of, kind of think about <clears throat> when the Bible talks about the devil coming after us. You know, over there in 1 Thessalonians 4, it says, He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. It's kind of a tennis uh, terminology. And I, I, could just, I could just see the devil uh, throwing curveballs at us. And uh, he thinks he's got us. Got us in the corner. And you just keep popping it back at him. And he knocks you over. You fall down. You get back up and just keep coming. Boy, pretty soon, he's just going to cry and run away. The Bible says resist the devil and what will happen? He'll flee from you. He's not used to being beat. Because as soon as he throws one spin at you, it's like, oh no, I'm done. One curveball, uh oh, I'm done. And all you have to do is just keep getting back up again, and you'll beat him. You see, that's a principle throughout the Bible. God requires it, He asks us to do this. He knows we're going to fall, He knows we're but flesh. He knows about us. He says, get back up again. Just man. The best people. The most balanced people fall. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> In Lamentations, if you turn back over there, pardon me. Uh, Lamentations uh, was written by um, Jeremiah the prophet. He was called the weeping prophet. And that's why this book is called Lamentations. And he's... He's lamenting the, the condition of Israel and how Israel is failing, how they're falling away from God. And Israel was getting ready to go into captivity. They were going to go into captivity because of their sin. And it was to them He was addressing. He was saying, look at Israel, stop doing what you're doing. It's going to destroy you. It's going to hurt you. It was to those people, the people He knew were going into Babylonian captivity because of the sin in their lives. It was those people He was talking to. When he said in Lamentations 3, verse 22, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is Thy faithfulness. I love that song, don't you? Great is Thy faithfulness. O God my Father, there is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changest not Thy compassions, they fail not. As Thou hast been, Thou forever wilt be. Sing it with me. Great is Thy faithfulness. Great is Thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, Thy hands hath provided. Great is Thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Think about that. Every morning He said, His mercies are renewed. He set it up so that when the sun came up, you had a brand new day. Did you mess up today? Did you mess up yesterday? Did you mess up last week? Well, guess what? Tomorrow morning's a brand new day. This week is a brand new week. Thursday morning's a brand new year. Isn't that wonderful? You can try again. The just man falleth seven times, but riseth up again. You can go at it again. Get back to Bethel. You lost your way? Go back. It's okay. God wants you back there. He will receive you back to Himself. I want you to go over, if you would, the uh, New Testament. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to do what? To forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, sometimes church people don't forgive church people. You notice that, right? Sometimes we do stupid things and we get a reputation. We have a bad reputation and then a reputation follows us. God's not concerned with the reputation. He's not concerned with your reputation. It doesn't even bother Him if you mess up. Think about David. All the stupid things he did. God says, well, you know about David. He was my, he's the apple of my eye. Let me tell you what he did wrong. 
He's not, he's not even embarrassed about it. He, in Hebrews, he said, he said, let me tell you about Rahab. Rahab was a harlot. Let me tell you what I did for her. For her. You read in 1 Corinthians, he says, he says, and such were some of you. And all these things, you can't, you can't have it. You can't be this and go into the kingdom of God. But he said, such were some of you. You guys were all, this is what you guys were. <laughs> Sometimes we have a testimony meeting and we start thinking about the things God's done for us. It's embarrassing. We don't want everybody to know. Huh? Right? But when you think about what God's done for you, how much He's forgiven you, wow! And He tells us, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Man, what a blessing. In 1 Peter, I want you to go to 1 Peter. That's where I was headed first. 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter's writing in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Begotten us again. I thought, thought about Peter. There he was, the night of the crucifixion. Peter, Peter had left his nets. Right? He left everything. Uh, he was married. Uh, had a family. But he's following Jesus around. He, he just walked away from pretty much his life. I mean, he kept going back to his home because I know his mother-in-law was sick and he had Jesus come heal his mother-in-law. And I'm sure he lived in his house, but... During the day, he, he quit fishing and doing the things, raising the money, doing that. And he went out and followed Jesus. He thought that Jesus was going to take down the Roman Empire and set up a new kingdom. And wow! And that night in the garden, he told Jesus, you know, I'll follow you. It doesn't matter what anybody else does. I'll follow you chief priests and all the soldiers came around and they came to attack him and guess who pulled his sword it was only peter peter was the only one he pulled his sword and he tried cutting off the high priest's ear and boy peter gets a bad rap for that from us but he was the only one trying to fight he said i'm going to defend you jesus and he was trying to defend him he cut off the guy's ear and jesus healed the guy's ear and peter's like what what did you do that for i don't understand i have no idea what's going on here and then he stands and watches as they take Jesus into the, into the hall and he stands and warms himself by the fire. And of course, Jesus had told him, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. Peter's like, I'm not going to deny you. I'm going to fight for you. I'll cut guys' ears off for you. I'll do whatever. Jesus said, now you're going to deny me. So he's standing there watching and they're like, oh, this guy's with him. And he's thinking, well, they're going to, they're going to crucify him. They're going to drag me in there. I've got to keep myself safe. And so Peter's like, no, I'm not with him. A little while later, somebody come up and said, hey, I, I know, I recognize your speech. You're Galilean. How did they know what his speech was? Well, he's standing there talking, yakking it up with the people around the fire while Jesus is inside getting completely obliterated. Peter's out there yakking it up. Talking like he's one of the guys. They said, we, we understand. Your speech is Galilean. He wasn't just quiet. He was trying to fit in. And then, and the Bible says, someone else came out and said, absolutely, I know you were there. And he curses. And immediately the Bible says, Jesus turned and looked at him. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. He cursed Jesus at the moment, of the cru just before the crucifixion. I, I can't even imagine what Peter must have felt. I mean, Judas, when he realized what he had done, he tried giving the money back. Those 30 pieces of silver, Judas tried giving the money back. And they wouldn't take it. So he threw the money on the temple floor and walked out and went and hanged himself when he realized what he'd done. Talk about depression. Peter must have thought he committed the unpardonable sin. All, can you imagine all those thoughts coming back to him about one of you is a devil and someone's going to betray me and all of that? Can you imagine that coming back and Peter thinking, wow, I'm the what we would call the Judas, because we know now that it was Judas that was the one that betrayed him. Wow! I'm the one that messed up. I'm just going to hell. I'm, there's nothing I can do about it. And what's Peter do? Goes back to fishing again. I don't know what else to do. But it was there that Jesus found him. He sent, he sent uh, Mary 
And He said, go tell My disciples. And then He says, and Peter. Tell Peter too. Make sure you don't miss Peter. Why? Because the Lord knew who Peter was. He knew what was in his heart. He knew that a just man falleth seven times. He knew that he was but dust. And He said, Peter's going to get back up again. He's going to get back up again. I know he's fallen. He knew that he was going to fall before he fell. He predicted that he was going to fall. He said, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. He knew it already. And Jesus, after He's resurrected from the grave, He comes out and finds Him fishing. Peter grabs his coat around him. And, you know, he was probably in a swimming trunks. Jumped into the water. That's another story for another time. He jumped in the water. The Bible says he was naked. Covered himself with this coat. <clears throat> he said he knew it was the Lord. And you know what? He comes to land and Jesus looks at him and He said, Peter, do you really love me? Lovest thou me? He asked him three times was after then, just a few days later, that Peter stands up in the middle of the marketplace and begins to testify of God's love and power. And begins to testify about the sacrifice. Because it is then that Peter begins to understand that Jesus paid the price for his sin. <laughs> As Peter lived his life, Leading the church. Opening the door to the Gentiles. Telling people about the wonderful love of Christ. Peter got messed up. In the book of Galatians, it said he, he lost track of himself for a while. And he went back and, and separated himself from the Gentiles again. And kind of lost track. And Paul came to him and argued with him. Called him a heretic, probably. Paul said, I stood him to face for he was to bl be blamed. And Peter got right with God again. And later, now as an old man, he's sitting there writing and he says, boy, he said, pay attention to Brother Paul. He's a beloved Brother Paul. Pay attention to what he has to say. Some of the things he says are kind of hard. But he said, it's right. Stay with it. And there, that Peter sits there and he's writing with his quill. Can you see him barely peeking over his spectacles, sitting there with an inkwell and a candle and he's writing with a, a quill and he, he writes these words. He has begotten us again unto a lively hope. Hey, he lost his hope. He lost his hope for himself. He lost his hope for Israel. He lost his hope for the salvation of the world. But when Jesus came out of the grave, Peter says, hmm, boy, he gave me another start. I got a fresh start. I want to tell you something. The God we serve believes not just in second chances but in third chances, in fourth chances, in fifth chances, in sixth chances. You know, the Bible tells us that Peter went to the Lord and said, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? And he said, no, seven times seventy. That's 490 times in one day. And if the Lord does that for... He wants us to do that to each other. How much more would He do for us? He'll forgive you and cleanse you. He'll put you back in fellowship with Him. He'll give you a chance again. He'll let you serve again. <laughs> He'll give you a hope again. I want you to look at James. James chapter 5. It says in verse 19, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, verse 19, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death. And watch this. And shall hide a multitude of sins. Do you know what I find out very interesting? God doesn't want you to hide yourself from your sins. But He's not always interested in exposing everything you've ever done to everybody. The Bible tells us we're supposed to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. He wants us to put Christ on top of us. To cover ourselves with Jesus Christ. Are you with me? 
He wants us to cover ourselves with Christ. Why? To hide a multitude of sins. Uh, I think you should confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. When you have faults, I think it's good to confess them. Work on them. Everybody knows you got those faults anyway. Learn how to care, bear each other's burdens. But I'll, I'll be honest with you. There's some things when you fall, if you fall, God's not always always quick to expose it. He does it for some people. Some men's sins are revealed beforehand, the Bible says. But not everyone. He wants, us to, he, wants you to, he wants you to bury that thing. Romans 6 says bury those sins. Bury them. He puts them in the sea of His forgetfulness. He doesn't want to remember them against you anymore. That's what the Bible teaches. So boy, I've, I've messed up. Well, of course you have. You're human. Guess what? Thursday, you've got a whole new year. Tomorrow morning, you got a whole new day. You got a new evening right now. Right in front of you. It's the slate's clean. Huh? His mercies are renewed every morning. Give it another shot. Make a commitment to God. Don't make a stupid vow. But make a, make a commitment to God and, tr- and give it your best. Try. Say, well, I've done this and it's been wrong and I shouldn't do that. And boy, but I've just yielded. Don't yield yourself to sin. Yield yourself to righteousness. Don't give in and say, that's just what I am. No, no. You're, you're a child of God. The Holy Spirit of God lives in What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God? You're not your own? That your body's a temple of the Holy Ghost. Don't walk around saying, I'm just, there's no difference between me and someone else because I'm just a sinner. Well, of course you're a sinner saved by grace. Of course you're forgiven. But hey, tomorrow is a new day. Yeah, you messed up before, but tomorrow you don't have to. The power of God is given to you, the grace of God is given to you, the mercy of God is given to you. You don't have to mess up tomorrow. Tomorrow isn't even here yet. It's still clean and pure and ready to, ready for you to make a difference. Right? So you remember a time when you were right with God and you're not there right now. You've let a lot of the idols of the world get into you. You've let things creep into your life. Go back to Bethel. God's inviting you back to Bethel. He's telling you, come on back! You want revival in your heart? He's inviting you to be revived. He's inviting you to invite Him back into your life. Give it another shot. The just man falleth seven times, but riseth up again. Huh? I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I, I think that tonight, Miss Diane, if you want to make your way to the piano, I think tonight, I think the Lord would have us to open the altar for a little bit. We'll take the cameras offline and just between us, well, let's um, let's listen to. A little bit of music here. Let the piano play for a little bit, and I don't know. I don't know what it is that you're struggling with, but maybe you've fallen so many times you think it's there's no hope. Hey, why don't you make your way back to Bethel? Come on up here to this old-fashioned altar. Come on up. Get out of your seat. Come on. Don't don't wait. Don't wait for somebody else to move. You need to get back in fellowship with God. You need to get right with God. Get out of your seat and come up here to this altar and kneel down here. Come on, join me up here. Time to get back to Bethel. Join these others that are coming. Come on. Come on and kneel, kneel here at this altar. Talk to God. Come ahead. Come ahead. Don't wait for someone else. Just get up and go. Lead. Come on. Join these folks here.
It's time to get right with God. Get some things fixed. Come ahead. Tomorrow's a new day. You hear the Savior calling? Fresh starts waiting for you. Father in heaven, thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for speaking to us and challenging us and encouraging us. Pray that you'd help us to go out of here and not forget what we've learned. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I let you go here, um, most of you know Zach Klingler. His, he owns Kaz Amusements. Most people know him. We call him Kaz. Um, his dad contacted me this morning and said, asked if we would pray for him because he had a 104 fever today, 104, that's pretty high, and so we've been praying for him today, and he just sent me a message a few minutes ago and said that his fever's down to 101, but he's asked if, if our church would pray for him, um, he usually comes, he comes on Wednesday nights and helps us with our program, and you'll see him, you see him in and around a lot, helping around here, but um, just pray for him, okay, he's um, trying to do right and serve the Lord, and Heaven. He said he never get. His dad was concerned. Said he never gets sick. So uh, if you guys remember to pray for him tonight before you go to bed, that'd be good. All right. All right. God bless you.